Segway, to continue at once with the next musical selection or composition. Segway, to make a transition directly from one section or theme Segway, to another. Segway, to move smoothly and unhesitatingly from one state, situation, condition, or element to another. Segway, to perform in the manner of the preceding section. Segway, to make a transition from one thing to another smoothly and without interruption. This is Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of the College of Arts and Sciences at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hello, everybody. Mr. Steve Jankowski was born in Rolla, Missouri. He obtained his bachelor's degree in mass communications at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and today he is the director of the Alumni Affairs and executive director of the SIUE Alumni Association of that university. Welcome to Segway, Mr. Jankowski. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Happy to be here. When you began your career, you thought of becoming a TV radio reporter. How was that? Uh, I was a student here in broadcasting, and I heard that there was an opening at WSIE in the sports department. And having had no experience in broadcasting at all, but falling into what I came to love as my career, I applied and auditioned for the position with the sports department here at WSIE and was given the task of doing a sports cast in the evening here on this radio station in 1972. And uh, within a few months, the position of news director opened, and I thought I'll throw my hat in the ring, and I did, and was given the job. And I literally learned on the job, as well as from probably one of the finest professors I ever had here, and that's Dr. Camille Winter, who uh, taught us about the strength and responsibilities associated with broadcast journalism and the costs, as well as the ethics involved. And so I fell in love with it, and that's what I decided I wanted to do. Now, that was some time ago that, you know, this is an industry that has changed a lot. So how do you see the difference of doing radio and TV reporting at that time and doing it today? Well, I can. I think, Al, the, the, the biggest thing that I see as a difference is how stories, what was determined to be newsworthy and how that happened. Um, just to use, again, Dr. Camille Winter as a reference, we used to take a look at six criteria that we would lay over any news story. Uh, and that was the importance, the impact, the proximity, the timeliness, the um, curiosity or the unusual nature of the story and whatever controversy might be involved. So you would take a story and you would score it on 1 to 10 on each one of those areas. So a, a story that came close to 60 would automatically be a story of great importance that would probably be your lead story. Now I think we take a look at what is the most sensational and what can be what can be teased and, and dangled out there from an emotional standpoint as opposed to what really has impact and what's important for the viewers or the listeners to hear and, and, and partake in. And I can tell you that when, when I first started doing television news, for instance, uh, I started out shooting film. We would shoot black and white film on a scoop of 8mm camera, and that's <laughs> my first job in Fort Smith, Arkansas, doing TV news. Probably cutting so, a magra. Oh, uh, and then you get to splice it. Yeah. And we would be able to do a soundbite of 25 to 35 to 40 seconds. So someone who was a newsmaker could actually make a full statement as opposed to the way it is now where we were directed as late as a few years ago when I left the business that if a sound bite was longer than 11 seconds, it was too long. The viewer couldn't pay attention that long. And so you had to get quickly through it. So I think we, the difference, I think, Gail, yeah, the big difference is that our viewers and our listeners are not really getting the level of service for broadcast journalism that they used to. It's interesting that you mentioned that because I re remember in the 80s when the big revolution took place on cable television and we have CNN uh, 24 hours, <coughs> you tune into CNN and you knew you can always learn about the latest news and that was a straight news on that channel. Correct. Now CNN 24 is like five minutes of news and 25 minutes of celebrities. Yes. And <laughs> It must be very frustrating for people like you and many of us also as listeners and, and, and watchers to see that that basically has disappeared from the panorama because it's no longer what is really important. is basically what is the latest fad. Yes. 
And I think what's, what, what even complicates that, Al, is that if you look at ratings, the, 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 the methodology, the metrics used to mm -hmm. determine what station is winning in a given time period, the, the people who actually are watching local news on television and listening to local news on radio is the population that is probably 50 plus. And yet everything that's programmed in news for those viewers is focused on a very young audience. It's very quick hitting, it's very emotional, it's very titillating, uh, as opposed to informing that audience. And so it's as though the people who are actually out there as viewers who want something of a decent product are not thought of in the process of developing that product. And so that, that becomes even more frustrating. And, and yes, I think part of what's also happened is that newscasters used to be viewed with great respect. I mean, Walter Cronkite, Eric Severide, Howard K. Smith, people like that, um, you know, even Mike Wallace and, and others who were very, very strong and, and had a, a strong work ethic and yet a great personality, they were known for their credibility and for their trustworthiness. Now there are times when I think many news anchors are looked upon, uh, you know, as kind of shady characters, you know, can you really believe them? And one minute they're joking, the next minute they're telling you a very serious story, and it's like, can you put those two things together? Yes, I think we need to understand that anchors are people, they're humans, but they have a responsibility to convey that information without prejudice, without some kind of a bias that they might demonstrate with a smile on their face or a hint of a laugh in their voice, and that all can translate to the audience. I think there was a very interesting thing I noticed uh, <clears throat> the other day, a few weeks ago, they were interviewing some people who are experts on Syria, about the mm. crisis on Syria, on CNN. And then they interrupted the broadcast because they, need, they had a breaking news. The breaking news, the biggest talk was, <laughs> Justin Bieber has been arraigned. <laughs> it's like, give me a break. <laughs> yes, yes. So that tells you a huge shift. I also the other problem is, now people got, can go directly to the news through the internet mm -hmm. and pick and choose whatever they want to read, ignore anything else. So it's no longer what is really important. It's no longer Walter Cron Cronkite establishing the what is really important because, I mean, we still remember when Lyndon Johnson said that when Walter Cronkite started to uh, criticize the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. that he said, well, if we lost Walter Cronkite, we lost the country. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in terms of public opinion. And it, that is unthinkable today that, that you're going to lose for something like that just because one broadcaster decides to say something against you. Well, and, and interestingly enough, when, when Walter Cronkite was on the air, there was a survey taken, and you may even remember this, Al, there was a survey taken if all communication was destroyed, visual communication, and the president was gone and the vice president was gone and, and, the, United, and the people of this country needed a voice that they could cling to and trust, whose voice would that be? And Walter Cronkite was yeah. the choice. Yeah. If all we had was communication from a single individual to provide us information and warnings and details about how to proceed uh, after some kind of a catastrophic event, the person that we was selected was that voice, Walter Cronkite. And the other problem I see too is that <clears throat> most people I don't think are fully clear about what is reliable information anymore. Because mm. you have all these uh, TV channels that basically have a political agenda on themselves. And <clears throat> so you, sh you say, who should I trust? It's funny because when you watch the major networks uh, national broadcast these days, uh, all this news about old people. Mm. And why is that? Because the audience that is left for <laughs> those broadcasts are old people. Mm -hmm. So they have all these commercials about uh, all these uh, medicines that <laughs> <laughs> only uh, uh, have anything to do with old people. It's like, yeah. there's not this, I would say, beam of information that you say anymore. Okay, I'm going to watch this for 30 minutes, and I'm going to learn what I need to know. Right. And I, I think what happens, too, Al, and, and Mike, as a former broadcast journalist, part of the reason we have a free press is to protect our democracy. And I, I fear oftentimes that we have a society who is not getting the full story or a balanced report, so they really don't have a clear understanding of some of the key issues and what really should they believe? I mean, when, when a student will quote Wikipedia as a source, yeah. there's a problem. <laughs> it is a when, problem. When someone will look at the Jon Stewart show and say, yeah, I watched a newscast tonight, that's a problem. Yeah. And so I, I think we have, as Charles Osgood 
put it one time, Charles Osgood, a, a great writer and CBS anchor man who does CBS Sunday Morning. He said, we have a, a tremendous abundance of information and a horrific lack of wisdom. And I think that comes from the fact that we rely on sources that may or may not be very accurate. Yeah. Okay. Well, tell us about one of the most important experiences that you had as a television journalist. Oh, my goodness. Uh, many. Uh, I think probably one of the most impactful uh, was covering the flood of 93. Uh, that was an event that, that impacted this entire region, and it didn't matter what role in life you played. Um, it, you were impacted somehow, some way, and in many cases very dramatically. And that was a story that literally began in the late spring of 1993 and lasted until November, almost December of 1993. Uh, every single day you did a story about the impact of the flood. And at the same time, uh, living in Alton, Illinois, the Illinois American Water Plant, uh, the, the water refinery, mm -hmm. was, was inundated. We were without water, drinking water, for about 10 days during that flood. So we literally became part of the story as, as a journalist. So that was huge. Plus, I, I really very much found great um, solace, I think, and uh, enjoyment in covering stories about people who were maybe in the worst situation of their lives but still could rise above it. Okay. Well, now you are in a different field. You <laughs> no longer do journalism. You are the director of the Alumni Affairs at Southern University, Edwardsville. But I want you to tell our audience <clears throat> how important it is for today's students to obtain communication skills regardless of what profession they're going to pursue. I think it's vital. Um, for instance, right now we're reviewing uh, scholarship applications. The Alumni Association provides more than $30,000 a year in scholarships. And right now we're reviewing the scholarship applications that have come in. And when you look at the scholarship applications and you look at how a student has written or communicated what they want to do, what goals they might have in life, an essay, um, the language used, the grammar used, the, the lack of eligible or uh, Read, readably writing, I mean, there's writing there that you look at and you go, how can you think that's communicating something to someone <laughs> other than scribble? I, I think we, because of the internet and other aspects that we deal with, we've lost that in social media and texting. Yeah. We've literally lost the ability to sit down face-to-face -face as we are right now, have a decent conversation with someone, um, write a letter, uh, communicate our thoughts and feelings uh, eloquently, uh, and effectively, and I think students now need to understand that if they may feel like texting is the greatest thing, but when you're out in the professional world, that person that is looking to hire you is going to want to know, can you write a sentence? Can you talk to that individual? Can you go out and meet with a customer? Uh, how well do you carry yourself? Do you dress professionally? Do you look professional? Do you act professionally? Uh, and those are all skills that I think uh, through our alumni programs, whether it's mentoring or otherwise, we try to communicate to current students. That's incredibly important. It's just as important to be able to communicate with someone as it is to get your degree and then go out and find that job. Something I didn't mention when I introduced you in the show today is that you minor in psychology. Yes, I did. And you have to deal <coughs> with a lot of external constituencies in your current job, a lot of people outside the university. Yes. To what extent do you think that particular experience helped you to become a more keen observer of people, behaviors, attitude, body language when it comes to communicate with them? I think it, one of the things I learned in that program, as well as just throughout my career, but that started there, was giving people a chance to communicate what they have on their mind. Uh, in essence, listening. Uh, now, I say that, and my wife's going to hear this and go, well, I wish you'd practice what you preach. But um, I, I felt like that program taught me, number one, how to observe. Sit back and just take a look. Uh, how to listen. How to analyze different perspectives. Uh, in one of my, I was in industrial psychology class, and we developed a, a test that the professor then said, can I use this as a, as a tool to test students later? It was a project that we did in class. And it was designed to, to gauge human behavior and nature. 
and how if someone was put into a situation, how they might respond. And uh, so it, it, it gave me a kind of a, a broader window into who we are as people. Another thing that you studied earlier was Russian. Yes. Because you wanted to become <laughs> a foreign correspondent. Yes, I did. And, and I was wondering, would you like to be right now in, in Crimea or, or Ukraine or Ukraine in general or in Kiev? Cover, covering those news? <laughs> you know, well, now that I'm almost 62 years old and a little less uh, mo mobile than I was then, uh, I probably wouldn't. But my plan at that point was to become fluent in Russian. Uh, and to try to become a foreign correspondent. And um, in fact, when the uh, Soviet boycott of the Olympic Games occurred in 1980, um, people at our station said, you know, do you speak Russian? Because we'd like, we we're thinking about yeah. sending a crew over there. And I said, well, I don't speak enough to be, you know, adequately sent to cover a story that immense. But that was a, that was a thought. And I, I had a professor who, in fact, sadly recently passed away about two years ago, mm -hmm. uh, who taught here for her entire career, uh, tremendous, tremendously gifted linguist and, and language teacher, and I just didn't have the discipline of the time to stay with it. To, mm -hmm. But I still periodically, uh, in fact, when I was at Channel 4, one of the photographers I worked with, uh, who's now retired, was from Russia, and he and I would periodically speak Russian to each other, and uh, had we had some funny instances and uh, stories that I share periodically. <laughs> so. okay. uh, well, now shifting or sewing into a different topic, uh, I mentioned earlier that you are the director of Alumni Affairs. Yes. And I wanted you to explain to our audience what does the director of Alumni Affairs do? My job basically, Al, is to uh, build, nurture, and maintain the relationship with the 95,000 graduates this university has produced. Um, as, a, as an alum, I believe that our graduates uh, would like to have and deserve certain levels of service and access to the university. And so my job is to basically be an advocate for the alumni while representing the university to our alumni. And so I'm kind of the bridge between the university and our graduates after they leave this institution. And my job is to basically try to keep them connected to the university in some way or fashion, whether through volunteering, through mentoring, through providing scholarship, uh, through donations. Uh, coming back to the university and being in a speaker series, or uh, we're, we have a volunteer day coming up at the gardens at SIUE, and we're recruiting alumni to come back and help clean up part of the gardens. So I think there's, my job is literally, I, I say I'm a friend raiser. I try mm -hmm. to make sure that our alumni feel connected to their alma mater in a very positive way, and yet at the same time feel that the alma mater should be responsive to them as graduates of this university. Now, you are a graduate from this university and at the same time the director of Alumni Affairs. Yes. To what extent do you think it's really important for someone in that position to have been an alum of that very university of which he or she is the director of Alumni Affairs? Well, I believe I've been being very frank. Uh, I think it can be a very positive thing, but I think it can also be uh, a difficult situation because uh, Depending on what my experience is or was with the university, I bring that into the job. So if I, say, didn't necessarily have the most positive experience at the university, then that might taint my attitude. And uh, so there are times when I think it, uh, it behooves the university to have someone who may not necessarily be a graduate of that university, but understands the relationship building aspect of working in that office. I understand the history of this place. Uh, I have great love and respect for this university, and I mean, it gave me a career that lasted 35 years, and now it's giving me the career from which I hope to retire. Mm -hmm. And so I, I but I, I, I think it's a plus and minus, and it has to be weighed carefully. I'm sure you have dealt with hundreds, if not thousands of alumni from this university. How would you describe something that is more or less common among at least the majority of them? Hmm. I, I, I think many of them are either from blue-collar families or they could be a first-generation college student. Uh, many of them, uh, at least in my generation, were commuters. They drove here to campus and attended school. They probably worked while they were on campus and um, loved this university from the standpoint of the opportunity they presented. Many people that I talk to, Al, who are graduates say, if it hadn't been for SIUE being where it is, I would not have gotten a college education. So I think that's a common thread that runs through. There are a lot of individuals who graduated from this institution who literally were given a future because of its 
location and, and it being here. When these alumni <coughs> come to the university and contact the university and go through you, what do you think is the major need they have about the institution? Why are they knocking on your door? Let me put it that way. Well, I think many of them want to know, uh, not necessarily in order of importance, they would like to have access to the library. Uh, many of them would like to have free parking on campus. Um, many of them would like to be able to network with their fellow alums and have career services. That's a key thing. Many people contact us and say, you know, hey, I'm between jobs now. Can you guys help me? Can you put me in touch with so-and-so? Uh, I think many of our alums also just want to know, hey, what happened to so-and-so? They, they remember a classmate that they went to school with and they've lost track and they contact us and say, can you put me in touch with this person? And because of our confidentiality policy with records, we'll reach out to that graduate and say, by the way, this individual contacted us. They'd love to talk with you. Here's their contact information. Reach out to them. And so that, I think, is why a lot of the alums come to us, is they want their transcripts, they want career services, they want an opportunity to continue their education. So we offer a lot of lifelong learning opportunities. So I think that's, those are some of the key things. They want access and service as well as those connections. Have any of them come to you and say, we would like to have a class reunion, and can you help us with that? Uh, we've had some individual programs do that. Uh, where, uh, and I know I'm, as a MassCom grad, we have the annual MassCom Alumni Night coming up. Um, and we have had some alums uh, contact us, and like fraternities or sorority groups. Uh, but by and large, if we organize something, uh, we get a pretty decent response from people who say, oh, that's nice of you to do that. And then maybe that builds from there in terms of building those connections that might turn into a reunion opportunity. Okay. Now, obviously, some of the major funding for universities come from individual alums. Yes. And I, I was wondering if um, that puts you in a different position when this is not just an alum coming to you asking for a particular service versus the possibility of the discovery process that this person is also a potential donor for the university. How do you kind of change the conversation, <laughs> to, put it, to put it that way? Well, I think, you're, again, that gets back to that listening. I think you, if, to, to be fair to the alum, you need to listen to them. Every, every graduate has a story. Every graduate has some recollection, some memory, some connection to the university. And if you listen to that and find out where that story takes them or where it has taken them, then oftentimes an opportunity is presented to you to say, by the way, how about let's look at this as an opportunity for you to maybe give back. And I, I tend to, Al, use something that CASE, the Council for the Advancement and Support of Education, talks about, and that's time, talent, and treasure. I think, you know, there's many ways that an alum can be asked to give back to their university, and I'm not necessarily going to directly ask them for money unless that's something clearly they want to do. Um, but, uh, for instance, we, this one of the scholarships we're offering is the Stahlschmidt Family Legacy Scholarship. This is a family of 10 individuals, one boy, nine girls, who grew up on a farm in Madison County. The family, parents, put eight of the girls through this institution, all of them now very successful. We did a profile on them on the, in the alumni magazine several years ago. And in a conversation with them, they kept talking about how incredible it was for their parents to support them to get a degree, many of them now with PhDs in teaching or professors. And I said, well, would you want to do something to honor your parents? And they said, like what? And I said, well, maybe create an endowed scholarship to recognize what they did and maybe provide that opportunity for others. They jumped at the chance. And now we have the Stahlschmidt Family Legacy Scholarship. And um, that, in essence, from hearing their story, led to an opportunity for them to do something to honor their parents. And that's how that worked out. Do you feel that because of all the changes in, in the society that we live today in terms of communications, social media and all that, that means that basically you have to keep up with all this new <laughs> new innovations <laughs> so you can kind of serve the students who may not call you or come in, in, in person but want to connect with you via LinkedIn mm -hmm. or, or Facebook or whatever that may be. Well, we have a LinkedIn account. We have a Facebook account. Uh, and I'm, I'm a Luddite. I'm a, I'm a little bit hesitant to deal with all the... I mean, I'm, I, I learned how to type on an, on an IBM Selectric, <laughs> type on an old manual <laughs> typewriter. And on an IBM Selectric, I could hit 75 <laughs> words a minute. Um, 
So I'm, I'm not as computer savvy as most, but we do focus on that. It's a reality. Mm -hmm. And so we make sure that even with a very small staff that we have in alumni affairs, that we have an individual on that staff who is well skilled there, who understands the technology and who could utilize those communication tools to reach out and make those connections. Besides those changes in terms of social media, what other challenges do you think are appearing in the environment of the alumni office given that society is changing very fast in many different ways? I think the, one of the biggest challenges that we have is that everybody's so busy. Um, you know, when, when we have done surveys of our alums, one of the things that we hear so often is, what has prevented you from coming to an event or participating? And the number one answer has been time restraints or constraints. And it's, and I think we literally are competing with everything, youth soccer, church, family time, work. Sometimes people are working 70 and 80 hours a week. I can vouch for that. And so I think that is the biggest challenge we have is how do we as an alumni office, provide something of value that competes with all the other demands and expectations those graduates have so that we literally can entice them to come back and squeeze us in somewhere. I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face. Do you envision because of the changes in social media that reunions or other events will take place in the virtual world <laughs> in the near future? Um, I certainly hope not. Um, I mean, I, I think there's, you know, there's a play. I have two grandkids, and we have FaceTime on our computer, and I love, you know, one one set of grandchildren, uh, one grandchild lives in Denver, the other in Champaign, and I love being able to sit down in front of our computer and see them and talk with them, interact with them, but it, it's not the same as getting down the floor and playing with them um, and holding them on my lap. So I would hope that there's never a change from an actual let's shake hands. Let's give a hug. Let's talk face to face. How have you been? It's been so long since I've seen you. Reunion. Uh, some things I think are good virtually. Webinars, career services, things like that. That's got a good place, but I hope we never get to the point where our reunions are all virtual. They should be in reality. So nothing like a personal touch. <laughs> that's Yeah, I think to me that's huge. The okay. personal touch is huge. But in the 30 seconds that we have left, can you tell us about what is your next big project? Oh my goodness. Uh, next big project is hiring a staff member and then trying to do as much as we possibly can to support the students of SIUE. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for your coming to Segway uh, from an alum and an employee of the university and a person who has been uh, tied to us for so many years. I think was very um, uh, useful and very exciting for many of, of our listeners who also happen to be in many cases alums and we know that firsthand. Yes. Thanks. So thank you very much. Thanks, Seth. So next week, we're going to have a roundtable of experts on the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln. So stay tuned. This has been Segway with Dean Aldemaro Romero, a production of the Department of Mass Communications at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. All rights reserved, 2014. Thank you.